Hi everyone, welcome back. So now let's continue our discussion on financial asset classification. Before we discuss the financial asset classification under IFRS 9, I would like to actually take you through the financial asset classification on under IAS 39, which was the standard that existed before the adoption of IFRS 9. All right, so IFRS 9 superseded IAS 39, and I'm actually taking you through the classification under IAS 39 so that you better appreciate the classification under IFRS 9. Under IAS 39, there were three types of financial assets. All right, you could classify financial assets into one of these three categories. One, held to maturity. Second, held for trading. And third, available for sale. Held to maturity, held for trading and available for sale. Now, what is held to maturity? Like the name suggests, these are financial assets which you intend to hold up to its maturity, all right? You have purchased a debt instrument today with an intent to hold it up to its maturity, which is let's say five years or seven years or 10 years from today, all right? So you are not typically bothered about the fair value fluctuations that happen in between, all right? All you are bothered about is the interest and the principle that you're actually going to receive. You're not bothered about the fair value fluctuations that happen between today and its maturity. Therefore, these instruments, held to maturity instruments, were never fair valued at all, all right? They were carried on their balance sheet at something called as amortized cost. What is amortized cost? We are going to discuss it in length in the next session or the session after that. But basically, amortized cost, you can think of it similar to historical cost. It's actually a wrong way to say that it's similar to historical cost. But you can think of it as you purchased it at one price and you're continuing to show the asset at the same price and you're not doing a fair valuation of that on the balance sheet. All right. Now, just because these are held to maturity instruments, does that mean that you cannot ever sell them? The answer is no. In events of distress, you can always sell held to maturity instruments also. But today, when you actually purchase the instrument, your intent under normal business circumstances was to hold it right up to its maturity. All right. The second category is held for trading. Held for trading, like again the name suggests, these are financial assets which you have purchased with a short term profit making intent or for the purpose of speculation. All right. These are financial assets that you have purchased with the intent of short term profit making uh, with an intent of making short term profits or for the purpose of for the purpose of doing speculation. Now, short term profit making, you can argue as to what a short term is, but typically anything less than 12 months, you will call it as a short term. All right. Let us say if I'm buying an equity share today with an intent, say, to sell it a week later or two weeks later or a month later, I will call that as held for trading. Let us say I purchase a debt security today with an intent of, again, reselling it either on the same day or one month later and so on. This is also going to be called as a uh, held for trading debt instrument. All right. Here, my intent is to actually make short-term profits or losses, all right? Therefore, I will have to carry it on my balance sheet at fair value, all right? I will always carry it on my balance sheet at fair value because I have to show what the val fair value is for the investors. In case of held to maturity, I didn't intend to make any gains or losses through the fair value fluctuations. Therefore, I did not show the fair value. But over here, this is my intent, right? I'm planning to make a gain or loss through these fair value fluctuations and therefore on the balance sheet, I will always carry it at fair value. The mark to market gains are recognized in the PNL. What do we mean by mark to market gains? Let us say on the 30th of March, I purchase an equity instrument for $100. On 31st of March, end of the balance sheet date, 31st of March, let us say the equity instrument is trading at $110, all right? The $110 is what we call as fair value. The $10, which is the unrealized gain starting from 100 to 110, the $10 is what we refer to as mark to market, all right? Because we are marking our equity share to the market value, all right? Now, where will this $10 be recognized? It, if it is a help for trading instrument, it is going to be recognized as part of your PNL account, all right? We will Will recognize although it is unrealized you have not realized that profit it is an unrealized profit still you will recognize it in your pnl account even if it is a loss you will recognize it in the pnl account interest and dividends that you receive on held for trading instruments will also be recognized on the pnl let us say on the equity share i intended to make a short-term profit over one month i received dividend or i received in, uh, interest on a debt instrument both these will be recognized in the PNL account itself. All right. So for held for trading instruments, 
mark to market gains or losses interest and dividend everything is recognized in the p and l uh, balance sheet you will show it at its fair value the last category is available for sale all right now if you look at the words itself it is something which is available for sale which means your neither intent your intent is probably not to hold it up to its maturity at the same time you do not want to make any short term profits it is available for sale meaning if you have the right opportunity you will actually sell it sometime in between all right so these are typically instruments which are neither of the two extremes held for trading is one extreme held to maturity is another extreme available for sale is something which is in between all right so it is typically available for sale so when the time is right if you are able to get a great uh of i mean if you have a great opportunity to sell it you will actually sell it and book your money all right you will book your profit so now these available for sale debt or equity instruments they are going to be carried at fair value all right so on the balance sheet i will not be showing them at its cost but i will be actually carrying showing them at its fair value all right in my example the fair value was 110 dollars on the balance sheet date i will be showing it at 110 dollars on the balance sheet all right the mark to market gains which is basically the 10 dollar difference that we actually spoke of this time i will not recognize it in the pnl account but i will recognize it in a in a separate component called as other comprehensive income all right a quick recap of other comprehensive income it is basically a section below the pnl account where certain items or the accounting standards have prescribed certain items to be taken to other comprehensive income so that they do not impact your pnl volatility all right one such item is the mark to market gains on the available for sale all right so this won't be recognized in the pnl the impact of that is that this will not be available for distribution of dividend all right because dividends can only be distributed out of profits this 10 dollars is not recognized as part of your pnl but it is recognized as part of other comprehensive income which through out of which you cannot pay dividends all right so this 10 dollars are recognized in oci but the interest and dividends are recognized in the pnl account only all right the interest and dividends are recognized in the pnl account when we sell this security all right let us say i sell the sec security at that time the gains that i previously recognized in oci will be transferred to the pnl account all right so any gains that i previously recognized in other comprehensive income will be transferred to the pnl account when i actually sell the security all right so after i sell the security when the gains are realized i will transfer it in the, into the pnl account and then i can actually pay dividend out of it but so long as they are unrealized we are actually going to show it as part of oci and we will not be be able to pay any dividends out of it all right now also maybe this is a decision that the entity actually has to take right on day 1 when it is purchasing a security all right let us say i'm purchasing an equity share or i'm purchasing a debt instrument or i'm giving a loan to somebody i have to take a decision on day 1 what the management's intent is do i have intent to hold it up to its maturity or do i intend to hold it up to for short term trading purposes or is it available for sale now available for sale just to clarify is something where the intent is long term all right you're not trying to make any short term profits your intent is long term but you're not saying that you know you will hold the security right up to its maturity you're being flexible in that approach saying if i may hold it up to its maturity or if i find the right time i will actually sell it in between all right and therefore because of the latter clause you may sell it in between that is the reason you are carrying it at fair value because over here you are now bothered about the fair value fluctuations that may actually happen in between all right because you are saying i may sell it at any point in time in between that is which means that you are actually bothered about the fair value fluctuations and therefore the standards have uh, require uh, the standards have required you to measure the, all the financial assets available for sale at fair value it's and not at amortized cost as in the case of held to maturity all right so these are decisions that management actually used to take on day 1 under ias 39 bad news is 39 got discarded we are now having ifrs 9 where obviously the classifications are not these but these classifications are going to help you understand the actual classification under ifrs 9 what ifrs 9 does is it it uh, asks entities to actually carry out two tests one is called as the contractual cash flow characteristics test Contract sorry for the pause there was a thunder uh, 
near my place. Anyways, the first one is the contractual cash flow characteristics test. And the second one is called as the business model test. These are two tests that you have to run on your financial instrument before you actually classify them further. All right. So whenever you buy any financial instrument, these are the two tests that you have to actually apply on that financial instrument. The first one is the contractual cash flow characteristics test. All right. Under the contractual cash flow characteristics test, you have, as an entity should actually see when I'm purchasing this financial asset, what is the future benefit that I'm actually going to get from this asset? The future benefit, if it is only contractual cash flows, if the benefit that I'm getting from holding the asset are pure contractual cash flows, then this test is said to have passed. All right. This, said, this test is said to have passed if the future benefit from holding the asset is in the form of contractual cash flows. And these contractual cash flows ideally are nothing but payments of principal and interest all right the contractual terms are nothing but payments solely payments of principal and interest and this is also referred to as SPPI test all right any financial asset you're purchasing evaluate the contractual cash flow characteristics test which means you have to see that the benefit that you're getting from the asset should be contractual cash flows which solely comprise of payment of principal and interest, all right? Solely payment of principal and interest or SPPI is a famous terminology that is used across the industry, all right? So this test is also known as the SPPI test, all right? Let us say you have invested in debentures. If you invest in debentures, the future benefit is you get interest and you get principal. So debentures pass the invest your investment in debentures, pass the contractual cash flow characteristics test. Let us say you have invested in convertible debentures. In convertible debentures, the future benefit is not just contractual right to interest, but you actually do not have the payment of principal because you have something in the form of equity shares. All right, the future benefit should be only and only in the form of cash flows. Whereas in convertible debentures, you have got the equity component as well. And therefore we say investment in convertible debentures actually fails the contractual cash flow characteristics test. Investment in equity shares. When you invest in an equity shares, in do you have a do you have a contractual cash flow benefit? The answer is no, because there are no contractual cash flows, right? You you may get dividend or you may not get dividend, and your benefit will be more in the form of capital appreciation, which will be realized later on. All right. So under contractual cash flow characteristics test, you have to see that the future benefit only and only comprises of cash flows, all right? The future benefit should be only in the form of cash inflows, which are payments of principal and interest, all right? If you actually think of it, if the future cash flows are kind of payments of principal and interest, what this test is trying to do is, it is trying to evaluate whether the instrument that you've purchased is a debt instrument or is it an equity instrument, all right? If it passes the contractual cash flow characteristics test, then typically it means it is a debt contract, right? You have probably invested in debentures. You've probably given a loan to somebody or it is a trade receivable, all right? If this test is passed, it is more or less trying to decide that it is a debt contract. If this test has failed, then it is typically trying to, it is just typically concluding that it is e an investment in equity contract, all right? Uh, convertible debentures is also similar to investment in equity because the future benefit is in the form of equity shares. All right. If you're investing in, investing in equity directly, obviously it's not in the nature of a debt contract and therefore contractual cash flow characteristics test is actually going to fail. All right. So under the contractual cash flow characteristics test, what the entity is typically trying to do is we are evaluating whether it is in the nature of a debt contract or is it in the nature of an equity contract. This test is done at a security level. All right. Which means let us say I buy one investment today. I will evaluate whether this investment fulfills the contractual cash flow characteristics test or does not. I buy another investment tomorrow. I will evaluate whether that investment is going to classify, get, uh, going to satisfy the CCFT test or not. All right. Investment three, again, I will evaluate for it separately. All right. This is called as evaluated at a security level. The second test is the business model test. Under the business model test, you are saying what you're asking the question of what is the business model of the entity? Is the business model of the entity to hold the assets up to its maturity? All right. I'm sure now you are able to probably link it with the previous slide. 
your business model could be one of the two one is it your business model could be to hold the asset up to its maturity this is called as hold to collect model it's no longer called as held to maturity it is called as hold to collect model because you're holding the financial asset to collect its cash flows right you're holding the financial asset to collect its cash flows so your business model can be either to hold the asset up to its maturity or two it can be to hold the asset up to its maturity or to sell it at an opportune time all right this is slightly linked with afs available for sale that we read earlier is slightly linked with the business model test too all right so the question on the business model test is what is the business model of your entity the answer could be your business model of the entity is to hold the asset up to its maturity which is called as the hold to collect model or it could be to hold the asset up to its maturity or to sell it at a right time all right this is called as a second if it does so if it is if it passes the first test it is called as bmt1 has been passed if it passes the second test then bmt2 has been passed if it fails the first test and fails the second test then the default is it means that you have actually purchased the security to hold it for trading purposes if your security if your investment is neither to hold it up to its maturity nor is it to hold it up to its maturity or to sell it at an opportune time the default category has to be that means you have you have purchased it with a short term profit making intent all right so that there is no bmt3 test because if it fails bmt1 and fails bmt2 by default it means that you have actually purchased it for trading purposes all right then over here this test is evaluated at a business level and not at a security level all right which means i am not going to evaluate okay i have purchased investment 1 what is the intent of holding investment 1 what is the intent of holding investment 2 the answer is no you as a entity you might have a business line all right like you know typically like you have your memorandum of association which gives the business objective right where the objective of the business is to investment invest in invest and collect cash flows let us say that is the object which is objective of the company's functioning if that is the objective then it is bmt1 you may actually purchase a security maybe for trading purposes maybe for short term purposes but if your business objective at large is to actually hold to collect then although the security this one particular security has been purchased with a short term profit making intent you will actually not classify it as held for trading but you will actually say that it has passed bmt1 test i'm repeating myself the in the evaluation of business model test is not going to be done on individual investments it is going to be done for a business as a whole all right in the business as in, for, for in the business as a whole meaning like an entity may have multiple lines of business one business line may probably be having an intent to only purchase security and hold it up to its maturity all right another entity another division within the entity may have always a short term profit making intent all right so whatever securities are purchased in division 1 will always be classified as hold to collect all right even though division 1 may purchase a short term profit making intent security i will not classify it as held for trading but i will actually say that it is purchased under division 1 there for bmt1 test has actually been passed all right i am evaluating the business model for the entire division or the entire business all right similarly division 2 whatever securities that division 2 purchases i will always say that it has failed both bmt1 and bmt2 because the division's objective itself is always short term profit making intent all right i hope you guys have understood if not maybe just rewind a bit and uh, just check that is the reason over here i wrote that this is evaluated at a security level whereas over here it is evaluated at a business level over here i am going to see whether each individual investment is satisfying the contractual cash flow characteristics under business model test i am actually going to evaluate it at a business level and not at security level and remember i have not uttered that this is evaluated at an entity level because entity is larger all right e An entity may have multiple divisions, so I am actually evaluating it, uh, evaluating it at a division level or a business level. I am not evaluating it at the entity level, but I am evaluating it at the individual business level. So that was about contractual cash flow characteristics test or SPPI test and the business model test. now the classification under ifrs 9 under is 39 we had three categories 
health to maturity, health for trading and available for sale. Under IFRS 9, those words are no longer used, but the categories that we have is amortized cost, FVOCI, which is fair value through other comprehensive income, and FVPL, which is fair value through PNL. All right. So the classification under IFRS 9 is amortized cost, fair value through other comprehensive income, which is also called as FVOCI, or fair value through PNL, which is also called as FVPL. All right. Under amortized cost, when will a financial asset be classified as amortized cost? It will be classified at amortized cost when the CCF test has passed and when BMT1 has been passed. All right. Recollect BMT1 is where your intent is to hold it to up to its maturity to collect the cash flows. CCF test was nothing but the future benefit is in the form of payments of principal and interest. So when both of these are passed, it is it was nothing but almost similar to held to maturity and held to maturity under is 39 was also classified at amortized cost because you're not bothered about the fair value fluctuations that actually happen in between all right where your intent is to collect the future cash flows you're not bothered about the fair value fluctuations and therefore we are not going to fair value it but we are going to classify it at amortized cost if i go back and we see the held to maturity classification this was also carried at amortized cost. So technically that continues under IFRS 9, just that it's no longer the held to maturity or HTM is no longer, uh, the words HTM are no longer used, but we are calling it as amortized cost after having these two tests as passed, all right? Does, just because you have classified it at amortized cost, does that mean that you will not actually sell the asset in future? The answer is no. Generally, your intent is not to sell, but in distressed times, if there are liquidity concerns, obviously you will actually sell the asset, all right? So just because your business model test one has been cleared, where you're saying that your intent is to collect future cash flows, does that completely prohibit you from selling? The answer is no. In absolute extreme circumstances, you may actually resort to selling of the asset, all right? That is called as the, that is the first category, which is the amortized cost category. The second category, which is FVOCI. This is where when the CCF test is passed and when BMT2 is passed, all right, what was BMT2? BMT2 was where your intent could be either to hold it up to its maturity or you may want to sell it at an opportune time in between, all right? This is actually similar to available for sale. And if you remember under available for sale, we were saying that the mark to market gains would be recognized in OCI. We under available for sale, we said that the mark to market gains are recognized in OCI. And over here, if this BMT2 test is passed, we are calling it as fair value through other comprehensive income because we are going to fair value the financial asset and any gains will be recognized through other comprehensive income, all right? So they have actually, IFRS 9 has maintained the essence of IAS 39 with some change in terminology, all right? IAS 39 did not have that CCFT test and BMT test, but we are, we are carrying out those two tests and we are actually classifying it under amortized cost, FVOCI or FVPNL, all right? So where BMT two test is passed, which means my intent is to either hold it up to its maturity or to actually sell the asset sometime in between if I find the right opportunity. All right. In that case, it will be recognized at FVOCI. And of course, when the CCFT test is also cleared, which means the future benefit should comprise of cash flows, which represent payment of principal and interest. Dividends and interest will again be recognized in the PNL account only. All right. Dividends and interest will continue to be recognized in the PNL account. The last category is fair value through PNL. All right. This is more a residual category. All right. Under IAS 39, there was a particular category called as health for trading where short term profit making will always be under uh, health for trading. But over here, FVPL is a residual category, which means whatever is not going into amortized cost or FVOCI, that will go into FVPL. All right. Now, let us say there is an instrument I have invested in equity shares. Equity shares investment are not going to clear CCF test. All right. Maybe take a moment or take a pause and think why are they not going to clear CCFT test? All right. 
Okay, now having having thought about that, they are not clearing the CCFT test because the future benefit are not in the form of contractual cash flows. All right, when I am investing in equity shares, I do not have future benefit in the form of contractual cash flows. All right, so CCFT test has failed. If the CCFT test has failed, it can neither go into this category nor can it go into this category. Therefore, it will go into FVPL. So equity instruments are always going to be in FVPL. I will tell you an exception at a later point in time, but for now, you can think that if I have invested in equity shares of another entity, they will always be fair value through PNL account itself. All right. Similarly, let us say if I invested in debt instruments, which I am nice, which I'm holding it for the purpose of short term profit. All right. If I'm holding it for the purpose of short term profit making intent, BMT one fails because I'm not planning to hold it up to maturity. BMT2 also fails because I do not, I'm not saying that, you know, I might sell it at some point in time in future if I get the right opportunity, but I'm saying that my intent is to hold it for trading or for short term profit purposes. Therefore, it's more like it, it, BMT1 has failed, BMT2 has failed, and it will go into the FVPL category. All right. So where CCFT test fails or where BMT1 and BMT2 fail, then it will go into FVPL category, all right? And all held for tradings will be classified as FVPL because BMT 1 and 2 are actually going to fail. If the CCFT test fails, it will also again be classified at, F, at fair value through PNL. All right, what are we typically saying? Let us say I have purchased a financial asset at $100. If I have classified it at amortized cost, on balance sheet date, it will continue to be shown as $100. Interest income or dividend income on that will be taken into PNL account. If I'm classifying it as FVOCI, then I'm not bothered about my $100 cost. I'm bothered about the $110 of fair value. The $10 gain will be taken to other comprehensive income, but any interest and dividends will be taken to uh, PNL account. If my intent is fair value through PNL, on the fair value through PNL, if I will recognize the $10 mark to market gains also in my PNL because that is my business objective. All right. I would like to make profits through uh, market value fluctuations and therefore any gains or losses, even if it is unrealized, I will actually recognize it in my PNL account. All right. Now, more for theoretical purpose, fair value through PNL account, the FVPL can actually be broken down into two. One is held for trading FVPL. The other is non-trading FVPL, all right? Held for trading and non-trading FVPL. Held for trading FVPL are basically those where we are, where the intent is actually to hold it for trading purposes, all right? I purchased a debt instrument. I purchased an equity instrument with a short-term profit-making intent, all right? They are going to be classified as held for trading and they will be classified at fair value through PNL. Just coin as an to coin it as an example, let us say I've invested in convertible debentures, all right? In convertible debentures, obviously the CCFT test has failed. And in that case, it will be classified as fair value through PNL, but I will not classify it necessarily as held for trading. I might classify it as non-trading fair value through PNL, all right? Because my intent is not to make short-term profits through these convertible debentures. I intend to hold it fairly for a longer period of time, but I would I'm still going to fair value it because it is it has failed the CCFT test and that will actually be classified as non-trading FVPL. All right. So under FVPL, you can have either held for trading instruments or you can have non-trading instruments. All right. Held for trading is obviously clear. Non-trading, I just, just to give us an example, I have invested in long-term convertible debentures. Convertible debentures do not pass the CCFT test. Therefore, it will go under fair value through PNL, but because it is long term, I'm going to classify it as non-trading fair value through PNL. All right. The what I wrote in brackets over here are similar classifications under IS39. All right. Over here, uh, FVPL is similar to held for trading. FVOCI is similar to AFS and amortized cost is similar to held to maturity. All right. I'm just repeating the last part of FVPL further bifurcation just very quickly. 
under FEPL, what I was saying is you can either classify it as held for trading within FEPL or you can classify it as non-trading within FVPL, all right? FVPL does not necessarily mean that the security that you purchased is held with an intent of short-term pro uh, profit-making purposes, all right? Just because you've classified some security as FVPL, it does not necessarily mean that it is actually held for trading, all right? Because within FVPL, you can also have non-trading FVPL. The example that I gave you was convertible debentures, where if I have actually purchased long-term convertible debentures they will be fair value through pnl but they are not held for trading but they will be classified as non trading fepl that is the classification under ifrs 9 all right so amortized cost feoci and fepl in the next class we'll actually see how will we account for a security when we purchase it at amortized cost all right when we classify it at amortized cost how will the recognition and measurement take place from day one right up to its maturity how will I actually recognize interest income or dividend income and so on is under each category is what we will actually see in the lectures to come. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.